Jeff Pott. And I really hope the video will be on. So yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you all for being here uh, so late in the day. I'm a little sleepy, you probably are too, but hopefully you will enjoy this. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, open source dev containers. Uh, my name is Rich Burrows. I've been involved in open source communities for about 30 years now, going clear back to the early Linux days when you would install Linux off of a stack of floppy disks. Um, so yeah, very much a big fan of open source. I'm creator and host of a podcast called Cube Cuddle, where I interview people from the Kubernetes community. I have spoken with people like Joe Bita and Kelsey Hightower and Liz Rice and lots of others. So uh, feel free to check that out. Just search in your podcast player for Cube Cuddle. Um, before getting into developer relations, I worked in operations roles of various kinds for over 20 years. And as a result of that, I have seen some things. So we're gonna be talking a lot about dev containers today, and let's start off with the question, why should we even care about dev containers? Yeah, so it turns out that provisioning dev containers is a hard problem, and it has been since the beginning of time. So to illustrate this, I wanna time travel with you back to the year 2004. And this is the year that Napoleon Dynamite came out, if you want a frame of reference. Um, I was doing DevOps back then before there was really even a word for it. Um, I worked at a small startup with a payments product. I was embedded with a team of application developers. They wrote services in Java and several other languages. And I did manual deploys of their code. I configured the services. I did a lot of troubleshooting of problems. I did some other things even, like if they needed a new port opened on the firewall or a new you know, farm on the load balancer, I would run interference for those kinds of things. So worked really, really closely with the application engineers. And uh, what happened back then when we hired a new dev? They were handed a laptop. They went to an internal wiki page with lots of instructions, like you could just scroll down and down and down. They installed a bunch of prerequisite tools before they could even get to the stuff that they wanted to do. Um, they downloaded the source for all the apps they worked with. They built all the apps from source. They tried to run the services locally, and I say tried because they usually had some problems they ran into, things like port conflicts or resource issues, maybe a service used more memory now than it used to and that wasn't updated in the dev config or in the wiki or something. So needless to say, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So needless to say, this did not spark joy. Um, another issue back then, and it still is, was dependencies. Um, developers sometimes had to manage multiple, multiple dependencies for multiple versions of their languages, and maybe even multiple languages. The fact that tools like NVM, PyEnv, RVM, et cetera, are so common shows what a problem this still is. Basically, any time a new language shows up, you can assume there's going to be some sort of a tool like that, right? And you know, for one example, Ruby um, it has a very complicated environment. There was RVM initially, and then RBM got invite, invented. Um, Bundler is a big part of that ecosystem, and managing dependencies in these Bundler files could be really, really uh, makes you want to pull your hair out sometimes. So let's jump forward in time to 2013. And this is when Docker showed up. Um, Docker, it popularized the idea of the container. Um, it was using largely capabilities that already existed in the Linux kernel at that point in time. There was a thing called LXC. And, uh, but what the Docker folks did is they made it really, really easy to use that stuff, right? That, to do it on your laptop. And developers tried it. They got super excited about building containers on their laptop and running them. And it turned out that while it was super easy to do this stuff on your laptop, it was a lot less easy to do it in production where you had a lot of other concerns like security and reliability and all these other things. And so um, while it excited a lot of people, the actual production adoption was, was kind of slow. And Docker solved some of the problems, you know, in terms of this this reality of being able to have good dev environments, but it didn't by, uh, by any means solve all of them. 
And so meanwhile, there was a thing going on called infrastructure as code that you have probably heard of. And I was very much in that world. Um, I was in the Puppet community for a few years. And then I actually ended up working at Puppet as an SRE. And so I was one of the people who helped maintain the, the Puppet system we used to manage our own internal infrastructure. And so, uh, you know, was very involved in infrastructure as code. And we learned a lot of things during this time period when we were working with it. Um, one of the things that we learned is that the, the infrastructure as code was self-documenting um, because everything was written down in the code. If you had a question, a lot of times you could just answer it yourself by going to look at the code. Um, it didn't get stale like a wiki page. Um, you know, if you worked off those kinds of instructions like a wiki page, you've probably had that experience where you go and you look and the last modified date is like two or three years ago and you're not sure if the stuff is still up to date. And if you've been around for a while, maybe even in your head, you're trying to remember what changed since then, you know. Um, and the great thing about infrastructure as code is that the code gets run, you know, probably even multiple times a day, if not more frequently. And so, you know, you can trust it. You know that it's up to date. And then it helps a lot with onboarding, and this is related to that first point, right? Um, a new person on the team sometimes can even answer their own questions just by looking at the code. So can we do dev environments as code? Let's uh, jump forward in time again, uh, and we'll go to 2020 now when GitHub Code Spaces launched in preview. Um, a tool called Gitpod, another service, um, launched around this same time period. And code spaces made it really easy to have development environments in this kind of managed services scenario. And code spaces is great, but um, it's proprietary. It's a managed service, and managed services have pluses and minuses, right? The great thing about a managed service is that they hopefully make it really, really easy for you to do what you need to do. You know, they're kind of trying to solve one problem, and hopefully they make it really easy um, to do that. But some of the downsides are a lot of times you have less control, less flexibility, and they're going to charge you a premium you know, for using that service. Uh, you are using infrastructure that they're providing on, uh, on your behalf, and they're marking that up, right, because they're a business. And that's cool, they need to do that. But um, uh, one other thing too is that um, the free version of Code Spaces limits the amount of hours and storage you can use. Uh, maybe 30 hours a week is enough for you, but if you're a full-time developer, it may not be. And then there's also a thing called the Dev Container Standard that happened around the same time period. It was created initially by Microsoft for their tools, so uh, Code Spaces and for VS Code. Um, it's an open standard, though, even though it was created by Microsoft. One of the great things about it is that almost everything you need to develop is in the container. So literally, you have an IDE, and then you have the dev container, and that's got everything else in it. So it solves a lot of these problems that we've been talking about. And the configuration for it is defined in a file called devcontainer.json. And there is a website for the standard itself. Um, it's just called containers.dev. And so if you're interested in learning more about the um, containers, the development container standard, there's a lot of information there. So in May, uh, we at Loft Labs launched this thing called DevPod. And DevPod is open source. It uses the Mozilla public license, and it also uses that dev container standard. It's client only, which I think is super cool. Um, it ships as a lightweight desktop app for Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. Um, there is also a CLI if you prefer to do things that way. Um, there's nothing to install on a server, and I think this is really great. Um, you don't have to go to your IT team and open up a ticket for them to like install some service or extensions or something like that. Um, it's all just on your laptop. And you can change where you run the dev containers on the fly. So you can have a dev container and run it locally while you're doing your development, but then maybe you hit a place where you want to uh, run some acceptance tests or do something else that requires more horsepower. You can run that same dev container uh, against your cloud provider's infrastructure. You know, so it's really flexible that way. And it's uh, unopinionated. Uh, you should be able to use DevPod with any infrastructure that you have. Um, it uses the concept of providers, uh, similar to Terraform, if you're familiar with that. 
Um, providers define how DevPod creates and manages the specific infrastructure to run the dev containers on. So there are two types of providers. There are machine providers and non-machine providers, and we'll talk about those. A machine provider provisions a VM to run the dev containers on. So that's part of the provisioning process. Um, some examples are the providers for AWS, GCP, Azure, DigitalOcean, and Sibo Cloud. All of these are going to provision a VM. They do a few more things. They install Docker on it. They install the DevPod agent, and that's where the containers run. There also are non-machine providers, and as you might guess, uh, that means that you don't have to provision a machine. Um, it can use Docker, um, either local or remote. Um, uh, Kubernetes, if you have a Kubernetes cluster, um, it just uses a cube context to figure out uh, which cluster to talk to. Um, and there's a generic SSH provider that will basically you know, run containers on a target host over SSH. I don't think as many people use that one because they, they're, more likely, they're likely to find a more specific one, right? Like one of the cloud providers or something like that. Um, but if you can't find anything else, you can point it um, uh, using SSH. Um, the provisioning process works like this. Uh, DevPod initializes the provider. Um, if it is a machine provider, then it creates the VM. Um, it creates the dev container itself. And then it will launch and connect to your IDE using SSH usually. Um, and then as you can see, there's a dev container with the DevPod agent in it. Um, the DevPod agent also runs in the machine itself, in the virtual machine, and that's because it's going to manage the life cycle of that machine. And then we have the different providers. And here's a look at how that works. So you've got the dev container with the agent in it. Um, DevPod is going to make an SSH remote connection to your IDE on VS Code or whatever that is. And then you can port forward so that you can be able to interact with your running application. And there also are community providers. So these are providers built by other people in the community that you can actually access right from inside the DevPod app. Um, there's a list here of some that have been developed. Um, funny thing, I had not heard of any of these <laughs> cloud providers before um, we saw this list, but um, some of them are quite popular. Um, some of them are based in Europe, and I just wasn't aware of them. And so this is part of what's really cool, is that people can write these providers, and they can share them with other people in the community if, if there's not one that we wrote. And then you can also make your own providers um, with a few lines of code. Um, they live in a file called provider.yaml. And you can run them right from your file system, um, which I think is one thing that's really nice about that is um, say that your team is developing a provider that you want to use, but maybe it's got some information in it that you don't want to be public. Um, you just put that in a private repo, and people could just check it out and run it locally. And there's more information about developing the providers in the docs. This is a super, super bare bones example right out of the docs. Um, you can see it's got a name. It's got a version, it's got the path to the agent, and then this one is just shelling out and running a command. So this is super, super basic. You know, anyone that you would write would be a little more complex like this than this, but um, they are super, super readable. And then DevPod for the machine providers manages the infrastructure, and this is one thing that's really, really nice. Um, you can set an inactivity timeout per provider um, when a machine has no active dev containers running on it, um, DevPod will put it to sleep using the agent. Um, and when all the dev, co de dev containers for a machine have been deleted from DevPod, it'll actually decommission the entire machine. And so you don't have to worry about that scenario where you've left the thing running, you know, and a month later you get a huge AWS bill. DevPod will, uh, uh, can automatically just take care of all of that for you. And so, yeah... Uh, time for a demo. So I am using a Mac, and I have this thing that I'm using called Kalima. Have any of you heard of Kalima or used it before? Cool. Yeah, if you um, use a Mac, um, running Docker containers got a lot harder when the M1 chips came out. And so um, Kalima is super cool. It's open source. It lets you run dev containers, I run any kind of container locally. It's a Docker compatible daemon. Uh, let's just type Kalima here real quick. And you can see some of the things it can do. It can actually manage Kubernetes, too. 
Um, and so it's really nice. It'll just listen on the local Docker socket, and it happens to run really well with DevPod. So we're going to say Kalima start. Oh, it's already running. All right. Um, and so we uh, have a local Docker, and let's take a look at DevPod itself. So there are some settings. Um, you can, there's a button you can click to add the, install the CLI and add it to your path. Um, there's some uh, debug mode you can use, um, some other customization you can do. You can uh, set your local IDE. Um, there's a bunch of stuff in here. The next thing is providers. So we talked about providers already. Um, let's go ahead and add one. We're going to, because we're using Kalima locally, we're going to go ahead and add a Docker um, provider. And um, the Docker host, uh, like I said, that could be a remote host somewhere. If you have a Docker host running, um, we're going to use the local one. Um, and so we can just leave that blank. And then if we wanted to set the inactivity timeout, there's the spot where we would do that. And so we will add that provider. And then there's this concept of workspaces. And workspaces are basically your dev container. Um, and so we'll create one of those. And it's got the provider selected that we installed. Um, we could add another one if we wanted. Um, it's using my default um, IDE, which is VS Code in the browser. Um, but I could also point it at my local VS Code, or there's support for the JetBrains um, IDEs. There's also support for Fleet and for Jupyter Notebooks. Now, as you can see here, we could point this at a local code repository, or we can point it at a URL. And one of the cool things about this is because it's using that dev container standard, if we look at the Python example here, for instance, you'll see that this is actually hosted in Microsoft's GitHub. We didn't write these examples. Uh, Microsoft made this example so that people could see how you can use a dev container to develop Python. And because we're using that same standard, we can just pull these things in and use them with DevPod. Um, and, and that means that if there are things you want to interact with, you know, like open source apps you're contributing to or things like that, as long as they have one of these devcontainer.json files, you can probably use it with DevPod, whether the project really is doing that or not. So we'll use that Python container. And then um, there's some other things we can do. We can specify the workspace name if we want. Um, there are pre-builds um, and uh, yeah, the queen is up. And um, what the pre-builds are is basically you'll see the first time that we spin the container up, it has to like pull down all the layers and build the container. And um, you can use a pre-build to speed that up. So let's go ahead and boom, here we go. We're pulling some layers. And uh, this will take maybe just a minute. Um, it's going pretty fast for conference Wi-Fi, so yay to whoever <laughs> hooked that up. Um, We'll finish pulling, and then it's going to do a couple more things. Um, there is um, some configuration to um, install some Python uh, modules, and we'll hit that pretty quick here, um, and then we'll be up and running. So I think it's almost done with the download. Yeah, done pulling. And then it's going to do these uh, post steps here to build it. Yeah, so we've installed our Python modules. And then lastly, it's going to spin up our IDE. And this is VS Code in the browser is what I specified. So it just opens up Chrome. And here's my, uh, here's my browser. Um, and this is pointing at the, um, at the dev uh, container. So all these files I'm interacting with are in the container. Um, so let's take a quick look at this devcontainer.json. Um, you can see there's some things in here. We're specifying an image. Um, one thing that I really like is that uh, you can specify these VS Code extensions. So if there's like a VS Code extension that is really handy for your whole team, maybe you want to incorporate it into your official workflow, you could make sure that everybody gets it that way. Um, and then there's some other things. We're forwarding a port. Um, and then here's where we installed those Python modules with this post create command. Um, this is a very, very basic example of what you can do with the devcontainer.json file. And like I said, there's a, you know, a lot more information on that containers.dev site if you want to take a look at that and see the different things you can do. So let's take a quick look at our Python app. So this is a Flask app, and it is returning this index.html file. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's take a look at that real quick. 
and it's got this thing. It says VS Code rocks. Um, VS Code can do that. Yes, it can. So let's make a quick update here and say VS Code and DevPod can do that. Yes, they can. And now we need to start up this Flask app real quick. So let's do that. I'm going to cheat and copy and go back here and open a terminal real quick. This just takes a second to start up. And then we can go ahead and look at this in the browser. And there we go. We've got our changes. So, so this is a super, super basic example. Um, obviously, things you're going to do in a real workflow are going to be a lot more complex than this. But that's a, a really quick demo of how it works. And um, some more advanced topics that will probably come up. Um, you're probably going to want to commit things inside the container, right? If you're making changes in there, you're going to want to push them to GitHub, uh, push them to uh, Docker, uh, the, the Docker registry. Um, you can use a credentials helper to make it so that your local uh, Git and Docker credentials that are on your laptop are available inside the dev container. Um, we mentioned that you can pre-build the dev containers. Um, and if you are a big Vim nerd, um, you could actually use DevPod with Vim. Um, there's a way that you can make that work. And again, all these topics are covered in the docs. So to summarize what we've talked about, um, easy and repeatable dev environments have been a problem since the beginning of time. Um, the open dev container standard and DevPod can help. And DevPod lets you run dev containers on any infrastructure. So uh, here's a few resources. Um, there's uh, the DevPod website is a big one to remember, devpod.sh. Um, there's a GitHub. Um, the little tutorial, the, the little demo that I did for you is this DevPod and Kalima tutorial. You could check that out if you want to do it yourself. Um, there's also a section in the docs about using Kubernetes and Minikube if you prefer to do that. Um, we mentioned the dev container standard, and uh, there is a loft community Slack with a DevPod channel in it where the maintainers and a lot of other really advanced users are there and can help. Um, things like uh, writing those providers. Um, quick thank yous to the organizers of the conference, the volunteers, sponsors. I've helped organize community conferences. It's a lot of work. I really appreciate all of you, um, all the folks in the DevPod community, and you for watching. And um, if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, this is the place to do it. Um, and I'll be posting a link to the slides there um, probably tonight or tomorrow. And that's it. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. If you don't mind, can you go back to the um, your actual browser where you are showing the VS Code? So I would like to understand. Oh. Um, the, the code you are editing. Yes. So the other tab. So this is running in a local container. Yes, so I have that Kalima, my local Docker instance, and DevPod launched the container inside there, and we're connected to it, um, and that is, yes, this code is on that container. Okay, so now let's assume there is like hundreds of developers in the company, and yeah. they run a Kubernetes cluster, and then I want to give everybody a dev pod on the Kubernetes cluster, so yep. that they can develop here, build here, deploy here, so that they'll, they'll only have... Um, something like thin client or whatever. They don't have much computing capability. So how yeah. can we do that? Um, I mean, that'll work fine, you know, uh, by default. Um, I mean, you can um, you could have them all use DevPod and, you know, launch the containers like in a local environment or in your cloud provider, um, whatever you want to do. Uh, okay, no, no. My, point, my question is if I am running a huge Kubernetes cluster yeah, yeah. and I want to bring everybody here and Imagine they only have Chromebook without any access yeah. or anything. Yeah. So then I can help all these developers to build and deploy. Yeah, yeah. Kubernetes on the Kubernetes cluster yep. in the data center. Yeah, Kubernetes is one of those providers that's supported, so you definitely could do that. And that is production today. Um, yes. Wow. Yeah. I was not knowing that. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, you bet. Um, if you do have more questions, like I said, that Slack is a really, really great place to go to get help. I mean, what is the association of Loft with this? Is it like? Um, so we're the company that created it. We're an, uh, a startup company that focuses a lot on uh, developer experience kind of things. We have several different open source projects. 
Um, probably the one that's the best known is uh, a thing called vCluster, oh. which is uh, virtual Kubernetes clusters. Um, and uh, yeah, this is something that we created. Um, we thought there was a need. A lot of people want to use tools like Codespaces, but they want something open source. Um, we do also have a commercial version of it that we're selling um, that lets you do some other things. But uh, yeah, the open source version is great and can do a lot. Any plan of a hosted uh, environment on your... It's, uh, it's something that's being considered for sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, thank you, everybody. Thank I you. I really appreciate you sticking around so late. Thank you.